Well, welcome back from uh, the break. Uh, our next speaker is Amy Rowe, and Amy is the environmental agent with Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Kincaid in uh, Essex County. And uh, her area of expertise is uh, stormwater management and green infrastructure. And uh, she's a lot of, done a lot of training programs for veterans, and um, also she um, runs an organic land care um, program. So we're glad to have Amy with us today. And she's not wearing a Rutgers hat. She and her husband also have a, a poultry farm in Warren County. Yeah. Okay. Welcome, Amy. <laughs> Thank you, Madeline. Hey, everybody. Uh, so we're going to move away from business planning for a little bit. I apologize. I threw a monkey wrench in the schedule. So thank you to uh, Deborah, Barbara, and Robin for um, adjusting the schedule accordingly. Um, but I just wanted to talk about water issues, about availability, about irrigation and water conservation, which are all important on, on farms, especially in urban areas. Um, so is everybody is everybody already a farmer? Like what, what's happening here? No, you guys are just getting up and running and training. Okay, good. Uh, so we will we'll talk about some issues and um, some other things and it'll tie in nicely with some talks that are after me uh, about uh, land availability and those kinds of things. So let's see if this works. Forward. Out. Arrow. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, so I work in Essex and Passaic counties, which are very urban, uh, and so water can be hard to come by, if, especially if you are farming on a former lot, such as a vacant lot. A lot of cities have, have vacant areas um, that may not have water hookups. Um, you really need to, to find out what the water source of your plot is um, before you're going to be leasing it and before you are going to be on that land i don't know how urban you guys are but certainly in places like newark and patterson this is a major issue because a lot of those vacant areas don't have a water hookup and so trying to trying to connect to the water system is always an issue uh, so the the municipality that you are leasing from should be able to give you information about possibly Hooking up to the fire hydrant that's on your block, uh, there are, you know, you can get a wrench from the city that allows you to, to connect to that fire hydrant, or there are some fire departments that will come and deliver water to your lot, depending on what storage container you have. Like if you have a cistern uh, or a large uh, water container, you can, you can fill that up uh, through the fire department. There's all kinds of things. It really depends on your municipality, on what the setting that you are trying to farm you know, has available. So make sure that you look into that before you start leasing land. And certainly if you are renting from a larger parcel of land, make sure that you have access to that water as well, because uh, there are lots of farms that already exist in New Jersey that are looking for, for renters and for, for people to farm their property you have to make sure that, that you have a water source and that you can connect to it. Um, you can also talk to neighbors and see if you can share their water. Uh, again, in the very ultra urban area, like a, a major urban city, sometimes you can just connect to an existing system through a partnership with your neighbor. But again, that's something that you need to look at at a case by case basis. So just, um, you know, sometimes it can be a little complicated and certainly if you need any help, please don't hesitate to to talk to Rutgers and to talk to Cooperative Extension because we deal with those kinds of issues all the time. So please don't be shy. All right, now I pressed so many buttons that I don't remember which one. Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> so once you have your water source, there are all kinds of ways that you can actually provide water to your crops and to your animals. Uh, is anyone planning on raising livestock as part of their farm or you're all doing vegetables? Okay, a couple. Okay, so there are all kinds of ways that you can deliver water to your farm. So a sprinkler system is a great way to do that, um, but you have to make sure that you are adjusting the conditions of your sprinkler system. Like if you have, a, have an irrigation system set up, 
If you have a uh, automatic timer, make sure that you are adjusting it based on how much rain you're actually getting so that you're not watering while it rains. I have driven by many places that are having their sprinkler system up and running while it's actively raining and I want to wring their necks. Uh, so just make sure that you're keeping an eye on things. There are weather-based irrigation systems and we can talk about those in a little bit. Um, but drip irrigation has, has become very popular. It is a very low volume uh, water delivery system and it usually is supplying about one to four gallons per hour, which is, it's a pretty low, low flow. Um, but then you are losing very little water because there's hardly any evaporation. The water is being delivered directly to the soil rather than being sprayed all over the air and just evaporating into the atmosphere. So this is a very, um, a very sustainable way to, to water your, your crops, um, but it requires a, a pretty intricate system. So again, if you need help setting up your irrigation system, Rutgers Cooperative Extension is here for you. Um, so hand watering is another way that you can water. Uh, it's labor intensive. Um, but it is a great way to make sure that you are not overwatering because you are delivering exactly the water that needs to be there. You're not generating runoff. You are not. Uh, you're not overwatering anything. So, so that's a that's a good practice. But it's labor intensive. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and then something that you can do to help keep the water in your soil and to make sure that you're not losing water from evaporation is to add compost or mulch on top of your, on top of your soil to, to increase that, that water holding capacity to reduce evaporation uh, and to make sure that those, that any water that you are applying is, is sticking around a little while. It's not just burning off um, very quickly because that organic matter can really increase how much water can be held in the soil. Uh, so those are some best practices for watering. Please stop me if you have any questions. Um, so we also recommend that if you are going to be irrigating, make sure that you do it in the early morning. This is because usually the winds are very calm. Uh, temperatures are cooler. Uh, and some people say, well, what about nighttime watering? Unfortunately, over the nighttime, the temperatures will continue to drop after your plants and crops are watered. And so that can leave them vulnerable to fungus and mold issues. So we do recommend early morning watering, uh, not just for the weather conditions, but also to, to reduce that possible mold and uh, fungus exposure. So just keep that in mind. And then you really want to, to water your crops and your, your gardens. I don't know if some people are working from community gardens, um, but make sure you're watering less frequently, but more deeply. So you want to, to really irrigate very high, higher volumes versus watering a little bit every day. You want to water deeply, less frequently because frequent watering promotes shallow root growth. So this will lead to uh, plants that are not drought tolerant. Uh, like in the summertime, if we're not getting a lot of water, a lot of rainfall, you really want to, to make sure that you're watering deeply for a longer period of time rather than just a little bit every day. Yes, question. Yeah, so, so you have to do some volume calculations and you really need to see what your water requirements are based on your crops. And we can help connect you to those resources. But that's a really good question because the drip irrigation is delivering you know, the same amount of water based on based on how you set it. Um, so you have, to be, you have to be aware of that. So that's a good question. Uh, and again, your, your watering is also going to depend on what kind of soil you have. Um, so these are just general guidelines, but certainly it's gonna depend on the crop that you're actually growing. Uh, and then just make sure that you're keeping track of your precipitation so that you're not overwatering um, and so that you're not, um, not just creating runoff and generating stormwater. Um, and so something to also keep in mind is that if you have raised beds, which are pretty popular mm -hmm. nowadays, you may need to water more often uh, just because all of the, the soil that's there, it's not, 
it's usually not as, um, as water holding as actual topsoil and um, the soil that you have in the actual ground. And so those, those raised beds will, will dry out very quickly because the water moves pretty quickly through there. So just make sure that you're keeping track of your raised beds as well. This is a little rain gauge uh, just to, to help you keep track of precipitation. You can use anything. Um, you don't need to buy one of those. You can use a, a tuna can, a cat food can, anything. But just to give you an idea of how much rain you're actually getting so that you, again, are not overwatering. Okay. So I said this a couple times already. Please don't allow your irrigation to be stormwater runoff. As Madeline said, stormwater is my my specialties, so I work on this all day, every day. And so we want to reduce the stormwater being generated, um, not only because it's wasteful, but because it creates localized flooding, it creates all kinds of issues. Um, so please don't, don't water hard surfaces, please don't water the driveway. Um, don't, don't generate runoff where it doesn't need to be there, um, but it is wasteful as well. And so another thing to avoid is a sprinkler that, that produces a very fine mist that can just be blown away or just evaporate immediately. You really want to, to focus on the drip irrigation is, is the most efficient way to water, um, but please avoid those fine mist sprinklers and avoid watering in windy weather and that'll, that'll help you conserve water a little bit. Again, water deeply and water less frequently. We'll just keep just banging that into your head, um, but I'm sure I'm sure if you guys have been growing things already, you know, you know how, how to handle watering. Um, so there are a couple of interesting things on the market, smart irrigation technologies. They are weather-based, um, so they, can, they don't even turn on if it's been raining, which is amazing. Uh, and these types of systems can save billions of gallons of water across the whole US. Um, so just, just be aware that they are on the market. They are part of the EPA WaterSense program, which is kind of like Energy Star only for water. And so these, these rain, uh, I guess they're weather-based weather um, irrigation systems that have sensors. They can tell how much water has been raining, some of them, or how much precipitation has been raining. Some of them have, um, sensors in the soil itself. So it's not just keeping track of the rainfall, but actually how wet or dry the soil is. Uh, and so there's all kinds of really cool things. So make sure you shop around before you, before you put in um, your irrigation system, because these things take the, take the guesswork out of a lot of this, because again, it can be, it can be tricky to try to figure out what each crop needs and all of that. So why not just look at how much moisture is actually in the soil? So that's just another tool for you. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so another practice that you can do to keep your keep your soil uh, moist and to make sure that you are conserving water as much as possible is to use cover crops to keep your soil healthy, to keep your soil structure intact. Um, you can increase your soil fertility. Um, this also prevents erosion and compaction. And this will, these types of plants will also improve infiltration and the water holding capacity of the soil. So these are, these are radishes and peas, and this is clover. Um, I don't know how much property any of you have, um, but this type of cover cropping also works at the raised bed level um, because a lot of topsoil will be lost over the winter months and um, you know just windy, dry times. Uh, and this, these cover crops can also help keep the weeds down because they will outcompete uh, with weeds. And then you can pull them out and you can use them for your compost. Does anyone do compost already? You guys are already composting? <laughs> this is great. Uh, so you can pull those out when you're done with them and you can you can feed them to your animals or you can throw them right in your compost because they're not weeds and so they, they will add to your organic matter and to your compost eventually anyway. But cover crops are a great way to, to make sure that you're keeping that soil structure, that you are improving the soil fertility and 
they will help you help your soil improve the infiltration and improve that water holding capacity. So this is another way to, to conserve water that doesn't quite seem like it's connected to, to water conservation, but it's really a, a best practice, not only for, for keeping your soil healthy, but for improving that, that water conservation um, stability. Good, we're good. All right, so. One of my favorite practices is rainwater harvesting. Do you guys already harvest rainwater on your farm? Good, good. Uh, so this is simply uh, disconnecting an existing downspout and gutter system if you have a, a structure, and if not, you could build a structure. Then you install a rain barrel or a cistern to capture that water, and then instead of that water going down the drain, it can be used to water your livestock or to water your crops. Um, so rainwater is much better to irrigate with compared to city water because it doesn't have chemicals. It's usually soft water versus the hard water that comes from, let's just say, a well or something like that. And so not only will you be saving water, but the water is, <coughs> is usually pretty good quality. So let's talk about rainwater harvesting. So at the small scale, we have rain barrels. This is a 50 gallon barrel. This is a very small scale, um, but these barrels can be good. They're, they're easy to obtain. You can chain them together for larger holding capacity, but if you are working at the farm level, you will probably need a cistern. Uh, this one is about 2,000 gallons, but they are fairly reasonably priced because most of it is air. So you're just paying for a little bit of plastic. The, the biggest problem with getting these is paying for shipping because they're very large and take up a lot of space. Um, but they're usually reasonably priced. And if you, need, um, if you need help figuring out your volume, I can show you how to, how to figure that out. So from one rooftop, so this is 80 feet by 10 feet. So this is just, just the one side of this roof is 800 square feet. So if it rains one inch, you will have 500 gallons of water. That's one rain event on one building, on one half of this building, so just this side facing us. So in New Jersey, we get about 44 inches of rainfall per year, so that's 22,000 gallons you could be harvesting. That's a lot for your irrigation system, right? And this is especially helpful for those urban areas where you may not have a, have a hookup. Um, so I'll show you some pictures. Here's, here's our little turkey coop. Uh, this is 10 by 10 feet. And we have our little rain barrel. We have our gutter system hooked up. All of our coops are mobile. We drag them around every week so that the, the chickens and the turkeys have, have a new pot of, plot of land to be um, when they're stuck in the coop before home, they are out free ranging. Um, but this is a 10 by 10 coop, and we have been able to water all of our, all of our livestock just with what we're collecting from, from our rain barrels. Uh, so again, this is very small scale. This is very simple to do, and we could, we could have a whole workshop on building rain barrels and cisterns if you want, so let me know. Um, but at the large scale level, you can really collect a lot of water. Um, like I said, over the course of the year, we're looking at tens of thousands of gallons of water. And if you have a large structure and you have the space, you can really store a lot of water. Um, because one of the biggest problems with rainwater harvesting is you often need the water the most when it hasn't been raining. So uh, this can be a supply issue, but if you collect enough over the rainy period, then you will have, have some volume available. Yes? This is not my farm. Nope. This is, this is an a image from polymart.com. Nope. This is not me. Uh, we are a very small scale operation. So, so here's our, our little coop. Uh, but we have 10 of those, so it's, uh, it's a little larger scale than that. But, um, but each one has its own barrel, so we, we drag them around and drag the barrels. Uh, but this is not me. I would love to, to have this capacity, but we're not there yet. Um, so things to remember, as we talked about earlier, 
calculating your water demand is going to depend on your crop, on the species that you're raising for livestock. Obviously, cattle require a lot more water than chickens or turkeys. Uh, so just keep that in mind. And there are lots of resources online to figure this out. So please let us know if you need help. And uh, make sure that you're applying the water directly to the soil, not to the fruit or leaves. That's not only important for collected rainwater, but in general, this is a, a more sustainable practice. Uh, but for both uses, for rain barrels and rainwater harvesting, make sure you're keeping the tanks covered, not only to reduce evaporation, to keep the water cleaner, but also to avoid mosquitoes because, I'm sorry, you have a question? Do you consider that water quality? Yes. So you do? I'm sorry. Uh, so I was asked if the barrels and the cisterns will freeze over the winter. So that is correct. They will. So you do need to winterize. You will need to disconnect the system and empty everything out over the winter or at least keep track of it. Like right now we've been dealing with warm, cold, warm, cold. Uh, and so our systems are still operational just because we haven't had sustained cold. So it's been, okay, it's cold one night. Okay, now it's 50 degrees. Okay, it's cold two nights from now. Now it's 45 degrees. So we've been kind of just keeping an eye on the weather. But in general, you will need to winterize once it gets to a consistently cold temperature. Yeah, so, so getting to the, the first question, um, which now I forgot what it was. Could you say it again? <laughs> Cleaning. Uh, so the question was, do you need to clean your rainwater harvesting storage container? Uh, so in general, it will depend on, on how dirty it gets and also the color of the barrel. Like if it's a, a lighter color, like a white or an almost translucent, you will probably get algae growing in it and you will need to clean that. Um, but we have, we have those blue barrels that don't really grow algae because the sunlight's not getting in there. Um, but if you have a visible film growing in there, I would recommend cleaning it. Um, we usually use a very dilute bleach solution just to get that, break up that film and get those microbes off of there. Um, and then in terms of your your irrigation water, I haven't seen that you need to provide rainwater harvesting water quality results. I don't know if, oh, usage. oh usage. Okay, um, so I, again, I haven't seen that ever before. Um, I will be honest, I haven't kept up with, with the water usage yeah. report recently. Okay. Um, Maybe, yeah, maybe, I don't know if you want to. Okay, okay, he's saying something. Uh, so Rick, there's a question about if rainwater harvested needs to be uh, reported on water usage uh, logs or reports. How do I see the chat? <laughs> Left. Okay. Okay, no for reporting, but it's non-potable water, so it should not be used on edible crops without sanitizing it. And then when you're done, you're going to have to close those out. And then your chat will stop. So. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, we can follow up if you have more questions. So I'm going to show you how to sanitize in just a second. Um, so 
Let's get back here. We'll close. Oh, oh, he just he just answered something else. Hold on. He says reporting is only required for water drawn from wells, streams, and ponds. Okay. Thank you, Rick. We appreciate that. Okay. Okay, we're almost done. Let's uh, get through here. Okay, so I was gonna show you guys some things about greenhouse irrigation recycling, because I don't know if anyone's going to be working in greenhouses, but there are plenty of very uh, sustainable water ways to, to irrigate. So I'll just leave you with these ideas. I've got a couple of, um, what do you call these things? Not blueprints, but uh, schematics. So you can take a look at those, um, but I am going to skip to how to sanitize the water. So you're gonna need to manage those pathogens, which is the main concern. You can use a slow sand filter, you can use ozone, or you can use UV. And there are all kinds of systems out there, so please let me know if you need help figuring out um, what you need. Um, so I was just talking about greenhouse irrigation recycling, blah, 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 but you do need to sanitize that. So that does also um, apply to collected rainwater, um, depending on what you're doing with it. So if you guys have any questions, here's my info. These are our turkeys. Um, but if you need anything, please don't hesitate to call or email me. And um, I, think, I think there was a question on Rick's chat so let's see just a second whoops okay this, there you go so if your plants got a fungus or mold last season because you overwatered must you do anything to prepare the soil for next season to prevent the fungus from returning um, does any does any agriculture person want to answer that question Okay. All right. So Madeline says it is it is variety and fungus species dependent. Uh, so let's figure that out. If you have questions, we're all here for you. So um, yeah, you may want to try rotating crops, um, a different plant family. So please keep in touch with us if you have other questions about that. So oh, thank you guys for something completely different with water, um, but please don't hesitate to contact me if you have other questions. So thank you.
All right, cool. Thanks, my brother. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Hey, last step for our um, next speaker is Bias Fox, and uh, he's a professional organizer and urban farmer in New York, and he's a mentor uh, to many urban farmers and uh, community gardening organizations. And uh, every year he coordinates an uh, annual sustainable living empowerment seminar and other uh, garden and farming workshops. So welcome to Bias. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so uh, 30 minutes, so I'm not going to spend too much of uh, this time talking about myself. I will, I think it's fair that I give you some brief introduction of who I am and uh, the work I do. And so um, I, uh, hmm. I am founder and managing director of North Science and Sustainability Inc. Uh, it kind of grew very grassroots. It grew out of my organizing days through Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Newark, and um, really trying to direct my energy into something that really gravitated towards me. And so uh, I wasn't always involved in agriculture at all. Uh, my educational background consists of uh, creative writing, book publishing, filmmaking. I'm also a photographer. Um, I spent 10 years of my life as a, uh, as a book publisher, and I kind of crashed and burnt out in 2011 and found myself sleeping on my cousin's couch because I had no place to live, no money was coming in, uh, collecting food stamps. I needed to eat and trying to figure out how do I reinvent myself. And so someone told me about a group of people who had marched down on Wall Street demanding economic justice, and I says, well, I could use some of that, you know, and then <laughs> I scraped up some change, caught a path train over to New York and uh, walked a few blocks down from a World Trade Center and became indoctrinated into the Occupy Wall Street movement. And it was there when I started meeting rural and urban farmers. I didn't know what the heck an urban farmer was. This was October of 2011. Um, and I'm like, well, what is that? You know, I was like, oh, I grow food on rooftops and backyards, front yards, alleyways, you know. And, wherever I can. I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. And so, um, and then I started meeting uh, renewable energy technicians, people who are creating electricity out of the sun, wind, pedal bikes. And I said, this is great. And then I just became really just a student of that. And when I uh, learned about a group of uh, people starting Occupy Newark in Newark in Military Park in, a, in the heart of the business district, I said, man, I'm going to ride my pedal bike down there. I don't have to scrape up change anymore made it very convenient for me. And so I evolved as a lead organizer within Occupy Newark. And um, but then I wanted to start something uh, more geared towards my interests um, that was you know, spurring up at the time. And so created Occupy Newark Science and Sustain Sustainability Working Group. And we just started doing green stuff. You know, I attracted about 10 local green enthusiasts who says, let's just do something. And, we started doing things, organizing trips to organic farms and organizing workshops for solar technology. And then someone told me, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Alex Markolidis, uh, who was teaching at the time uh, in a charter school in Newark, he's a life science teacher. Uh, we met at this kind of green drinks event, you know. Uh, a woman would organize uh, people like, like minds to come together with some hors d'oeuvres and alcohol, why not, you know. <laughs> and um, Alex says, hey, did you know about um, the city of Newark's Adopt-A-Lot program? So this was uh, late winter of 2012. I says, no, what is that? He says, well, you can adopt a vacant lot for a dollar and turn it into a green space. I'm like, really? Like, start growing food? And I'm like, yeah. He says, and you know what? I have the whole list of all the vacant lots in Newark. And if you meet me at this location tomorrow, I'll take you around. I didn't have a vehicle at the time. And so... I'm like, yeah. He says, we can just take all the lots and just grow food. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And so uh, we went on this trip in Newark and just started uh, following the addresses and looking at the vacant lots. And one caught my eye. I adopted it, organized about um, close to 100 people from various different groups and organizations, institutions, uh, residents, local businesses. We all came together and transformed this space um, into uh, a garden and vegetable garden because I'm really into food, right? And so, um, and it was so funny because at that time, it was middle-aged European-American woman, a part of the Occupy Newark Science Sustainability Working Group at the time. They said, Tobias, you know, we love you, but we realize you know nothing about agriculture. You know, 
<laughs> You're really good at organizing, but you don't know anything about plants, do you? And I said, no, I don't. It says, all right, it's time we teach you. And so they became my teachers, uh, and I just started learning. They started teaching about, you know, nitrogen, carbon, all this stuff, you know. And I said, wow, and I became a sponge, and I absorbed it. And so uh, it was Rutgers Law School. They have a community law clinic that took me on as one of their clients uh, at the advice of someone says, Tobias, you know, you're really doing a lot with no resources. You should really consider turning this into a nonprofit organization. And so uh, I reached out to the community law clinic at, at the Rutgers Law School in Newark, took me on as one of their clients, and in July of 2013, helped us establish as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And so Newark Science and Sustainability, Inc., we advocate for the localization of food and energy production. We do this by way of hands-on education programs around urban agriculture, renewable energy, ecological building, eco-art, and wellness nutrition. And so urban agriculture tends to be the foundation of what we're doing, um, but it really expands uh, to so much other things as well. And uh, I've been recently fortunate to do some traveling abroad and uh, expanding my work into the Dominican Republic and also the Philippines. And so it's pretty cool, yeah. Um, yeah, and so let's just, first I wanna know, what, who are you, right? And so if we can just, I know there's, I know there's this, this being live stream, so I can't really have an intense conversation with those hopefully watching. Um, but um, at least give me some idea of who I'm in a room with, if that helps. It really helps me, you know. Um, so we can start here and then work our way back around this way, if you, if you don't mind. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, oh, Project Use to School. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Mm. Wow. Where? That sounds like a, an escape, but where? <laughs> You want to put that in like in a rural environment, urban environment, rural, like yeah, rural? The yeah. Idea is kind of nice. Right, 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 right. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Nice. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. I'm listening, I'm sorry.
<laughs> so so you don't want no 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 green lawn you know in front of your okay all right <laughs> hmm. right all right it's important Yes. Um, my name is Jason. I'm from Saint Lucis, and um, I'm a Catholic daughter. And um, I think it's interesting to hear that um, Christ was a Christian. And so I do want to be able to share that with you. And um, it's funny because my brother had a great story about the Holy Spirit. And I was at the youth block. I didn't see it. Oh, nice. Him. I was. I was. Yeah. I was. Yeah. Were you there? Did you see the panel I was on, or did you, you didn't get there that early? Huh? No, I didn't see it. Yeah, it was early. I was there. I <laughs> said <laughs> you wanted me. To, I'm like, look, I live in East Orange, and if you want me to be someplace at eight in the morning, we need to figure out how I could be in Jersey City prior to, you know. And so they worked it out. <laughs> it's cool. Nice. Um, when I got a little older, I got to know my dad, obviously, and um, he was very strict with me. Yeah. So you had to you had to dig figure out your your marketing, and you may have to go back to brand rebranding yourself as well. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's always hard to do that when you're young, but um, I was just trying to find my own path and not be um, right. chased by the crowd. Mm -hmm. But now I feel like I can still be that person and still be that person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Cool. So you said, um, and I'm, I'm apologizing to the online folks who can't really engage with and listen to all the things. Um, but the information really is helping me with how I want to give that information back out to you all. And so, um, but I do want to just touch on a couple of things. Composting is a science. People don't realize it. Um, and uh, it should be treated as such, right? The approach should be um, 
knowing that we're not creating garbage piles, but this is we're trying to create enriched soil. I don't create compost piles. I compost directly in the beds. That works for me. So at the end of the outdoor growing season, I just cut everything up and put it back into the bed. Sometimes I cover it up. Um, and so, so that's my approach. Community engagement, um, I know, uh, which kind of ties into kind of marketing and it's just me, it's just me. Um, so for me, taking the approach of social entrepreneurship, meaning um, uh, community programming, but also looking at the business model of it as well and combining the two, community engagement in all sectors of our lives is a challenge, right? Here's the difference about us as farmers or growers is that we're expected to um, be the web developer, the marketing person, the sales person, uh, the community engagement person, and then at some point in our lives, we're supposed to grow some tomatoes, right? <laughs> That's crazy. And so what I learned as a publisher is that I'm my first intern at a major publishing house in New York. And, um, and so I came there already with a background of independent publishing. And so I said, hey, I want to be a floater. I want to go to different departments and see how the different departments work, but also work with each other. Right? And so uh, the, the person who I worked under in the editorial department was very uh, supportive. And so she was like, it's all good, Tobias. And so and says, as a matter of fact, Tobias, we're going to let you come to our weekly editorial meetings. And it was then when I got to see how business actually works, right? So it was the editorial department, the sales department, the marketing department. Uh, everyone was there to pitch in on how this literary work should be uh, promoted, pushed, branded, and so forth. But when it comes to agricultural world, it's like the farmer is supposed to figure all this stuff out. And that's not how you run a business, right? right. And so we'll talk more, but the, here? Okay, cool. I, um, I read your story and I feel like I know you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a skill. That's a skill. I do harvest. I do harvest. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. So, my goal with agriculture is to not only demonstrate how um, and agriculture contributes to the wellness of a community but also the local economy. Right? And so, um, and it took some while to figure out that business part of it. And so, you know, me not knowing any experience, I'm like, first, let me just learn how to plant, right? And then I learned that there was other people like me in the community, uh, specifically North, and says, wow. And I'm one of those lucky ones who had organizing skills or this organizing background, right? And so I'm like, well, if there's other people doing what I'm doing, I know I can't be the only one with the same problem, which is how do we access water? How do we access land? How do we you know, keep soil? You know, because we can't grow directly in the ground, every environment is different, and so one of the stipulations in Newark is that in order to grow directly in the ground, you have to get that soil tested, show the city that it's safe, um, and then you can grow in the ground. Otherwise, that soil has to come in, right? Or be created through composting, right? And so, um, and so I'm like, well, I can't be the only one dealing with all these challenges because I never knew how difficult, forget farming, I didn't know how difficult gardening was, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, this is crazy, you know, I can't be the only one doing this. And so luckily I wasn't, I was, everyone was working in their own silos and not really communicating with each other. They were expressing their grievances, but not saying, well, how can we work together collaboratively and create solutions? And so, so that's when I came in. And so in 2013, I started organizing with, with like-minded people, other local growers, and it just started growing until today we have this North Community Food System, which is a collective of agriculturalists working uh, throughout the city of North on trying to figure out how do we go from where we are to scaling things up, right? And, and acknowledging that as we heard in this room, not everyone have the same purpose, right? But your intentions should be clear. If to no one else, it should be to clear to you as to why are you doing this and what do you hope to get out of it, right? And so um, <clears throat> I do want to just go into uh, <laughs> the, the, the title of the, of the topic, <laughs> which is, somebody say it again? I don't know. I can't remember. Yeah. Accessing land, right? Yeah. yeah, accessing land through reaching your person. 
All right, cool. Every city is different. Every do not go to uh, a town that you once lived in with the same you know, mindset, the same mentality that the town that you're trying to grow in is the same. Totally different. That's why they have different governments, right? Totally different mindset. And so uh, Nork is just a totally different animal altogether. Right? So you think that things work in a linear way. In Nork, it does not. Everything is out of sequence. And so you have to be able to roll with it. You have to be able to roll with it. Right? And so um, who wants to own property for growing and food production? On the fence, some people, I'm on a fence about fencing, but I have a fence. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge, so you can be a leaseholder or a landowner, right? And so totally different responsibilities. And so as a leaseholder in Newark, um, you know, you sign a lease, you have these guidelines, you know, follow these, you know, no alcohol, no, no, you can't, we can't have uh, an exchange of currency on the property. You have to do that elsewhere. And so I managed a CSA market branded and marketed as a farm table co-op. Um, and so I'm able to collect revenue before the growing season, which helps during the growing season, right? And so people come and pick up their produce, but there's no, no money being exchanged, right? And so that's, that's fair, fair game. Or you can take your produce elsewhere and sell it to the markets so or whatever the case may be. That's fair game through a lease policy in Newark, right? But you can't set up a business on the property if you're a leasee. That's just a stipulation within the guidelines of the city's Adopt a Lot program. And why is because if you start creating a business, then there are guidelines. So you have to go to city planning and you gotta get approved for that. You have to make sure you're in the zoning, you have to Blah, blah, blah. And that's, the, that's the, the difference of becoming a landowner, right? And so you have to create, you know, a landscape design or an architect plans. You have to submit that. You have to get approved. You have to go, you have to start paying all these fees, you know? Um, and it's, um, you know, it could be nerve-wracking, but it's, it's also, again, my intentions is clear. I want to develop commercial, uh, community commercial green development projects. I want to do that. And this project that we're working on, which uh, we're revamping what we call the Garden of Hope, uh, will be the first. And so we're going from this concept of a community garden to an urban farm. And what does that mean for us is that we'll have a hydroponic greenhouse. We'll have a walk-in cooler where we store produce. We'll have uh, an outdoor kitchen. We'll have a farm, uh, a chicken coop. We'll have an enclosed facility where we'll have a restroom and we'll be able to sell added value products and produce in this facility. We'll have a farm stand for minutes and then I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> it's like speed talk. And so that's how you go from <laughs> land access. I don't know, when someone says that timing, you just, your thought process is like blank. <laughs> And so I do want to add one thing um, is that uh, working in collaboration with rural farmers has been key to me. And so I work a lot with Dogwood Farms uh, in Hillsboro. John Knox is the farmer there. Awesome guy. Awesome, awesome, awesome guy. We've done some um, collaboration projects such as, you know, I learned about CSAs through him. You know, and then I says, wow, I want to I replicate this in Newark on a smaller scale because he has like, you know, 150 uh, produce CSA, 200 meat CSA. I says, wow, and he has a store on his farm. Everything he's doing is like, I want to replicate this. You know, and then, so he allowed me to come down and spend a weekend on the farm. And he allowed me to come and be a part of the CSA pickup so I can understand what that looks like. Um, and he also facilitated a CSA workshop on his on this property, right? And so, um, and then when I'm, whenever I'm like short on food, it's like, I got you, Tobias, don't worry about it, you know? <laughs> and so we just create these relationships. And so urban agriculture is not intended to uh, uh, say replace rural farming. It's just that the realization 
our socioeconomic makeup is changing drastically, and so we have to adapt to those to those changes as well. And we have to work in collaboration with one another. You know, and so I'm down in one minute. But if you have any specific questions, <laughs> you know, ask now or take a card and reach out to me. How did you build this pipe to pollution? Describe pollution. That's that's so big. You know, get. Mm -hmm. How do you think about it? Or do you take a different so way? So it's not how to, so, all right. So when you are, and this should, this should be in any given city that you're working in, right? Because if, if it's not private property, if it's city property, they have to clean a property up to sell it or okay. to lease it out, right? And so that's how it works in Newark, that the sanitation department will go in and do initial cleanup. They will tell you, like in Newark, there's a, organization, uh, uh, Iron Brown Community Corporation, they lease property from a private owner. They cannot break the pavement. It's all paved out. But with this new invention of urban agriculture, you know, this transformation of any space into a green space, we're able to bring in mountains of wood chip and grow on top of that. You know? So it all depends on who, who owns that space, deals with it. All right, so. Do you have a question? Oh. Do you have any regions? I don't know. So, yes, yeah, so Jersey City has an adopt a lot program. Jersey, Jersey City has an adopt a lot program. Um, and Nork has one, of course. And those are the only two that I know about in New Jersey, but they've got to be others. And you can also advocate for that if you think there's a need for it. And so, most, most municipalities, they introduce an adopt a lot program when they think. There's a need for for this type of program. You know. All right, cool. Thanks. Thank <laughs>